explode the body's organs with a single touch and weapons far more lethal than anything produced in the West. But truth is nearly as astounding as fiction. Underwater assassination techniques still used by today's special forces. Weapons that deliver fatal strikes in the blink of an eye. Triple-bladed weaponry that maimed thousands. Prototype poison machines. Evidence of fighters who can even cause delayed death. Ancient Discoveries uncovers the secrets of thousands of years of weapons development to reveal the technologies behind antiquity's most lethal killing machines. This is the untold story of the death weapons of the East. The 12-gauge pump-action shotgun is notorious as one of the world's most lethal weapons. Its lead pellets disperse from its cartridge at an initial velocity of 365 meters per second. But researchers are uncovering evidence from the ancient world that in an age before gunpowder, even the most simple weapons became lethal in the right hands. A weapon is simply a tool that a human being uses to kill. Students of Wudang Kung Fu in central China still practice the techniques of the 3,000-year-old Chinese waxwood gun, also known as a staff. Its history is shrouded in tales of lightning-fast attacks. The gun's techniques are said to have been perfected by a group of ancient Chinese Buddhist monks, who combined meditation with the art of warfare. They became known as the Shaolin after their monastery in the central Chinese province of Henan. In the early 7th century, they became involved in a power struggle over land with the warlord Wang Shichong. The emperor's infantry were renowned swordsmen. It's recorded that when the two sides clashed in the Battle of Hu Lao in 621 AD, the monks used their most famous weapon to defeat the emperor's army, the Shaolin Staff. But are the ancient accounts accurate? Can what appears to be a simple wooden stick really be a devastating weapon? Ancient discoveries have set up a test against the modern shotgun. How quickly can each weapon smash five targets? The gun I'm using today is a 12-gauge Mossberg shotgun that's designed to use solid slugs. This weapon is typically used by police forces, mainly in America, for riot control. I could train someone to use this to a competent standard within an hour. Peter will be going up against Nathan, three times world kickboxing champion and Shaolin martial artist. This is the ancient Shaolin staff. It's been used over 3,000 years ago. This takes time to perfect the skill, the accuracy, the power, technique. The shotgun's ammunition is ejected from the barrel by an enormous pressure. The pellets start as one mass, then rapidly disperse out. But how quickly will Peter be able to fire five accurate rounds? In 4.07 seconds, Peter took out all five pots, eight tenths of a second per pot. Now it's Nathan's turn. Staff destroys all five pots in 2.57 seconds, 55 hundredths of a second per pot, and one and a half seconds faster than the shotgun. That's quite a quick shoot for me, but I'm very impressed with Nathan. My time was 4.07 seconds, and uh, Nathan's was 2.57, so which is a fair bit quicker than me. I feel the test proved that uh, the ancient weapon can be used faster. The thing about my weapon is it's years of practice, 
years of dedication, timing, skill and technique. So once you master that and your mind works as one with your body, you yourself become a lethal weapon. The gun was designed for lightness and speed. In combat, it was used against swords and spears by blocking and sweeping the enemy. It became known as the father of all weapons, as other weapons were developed from it. But if weapons like the staff and sword were lost on the battlefield, there was another that could be used as backup. It was said to strike as fast as a meteor. It allegedly had the power to split open a head or break the bones of the enemy. According to a text called Records of the Three Kingdoms, it was deployed by soldiers of the Cao Wei Empire. In the 3rd century AD, this empire was competing for control of China. The meteor hammer gets its name from the great power in which it strikes its target. Compared to other Shaolin weapons, it has a longer reach and strikes with much more speed and ferocity. The meteor hammer is a bronze or steel ball attached to a three-meter rope. In a surprise attack, it gave its owner the tactical advantage of being able to strike from a longer range than close combat weapons. The main techniques of the meteor hammer is to either swing the meteor hammer directly at an opponent or to hook it over a knee, elbow or a foot and let it go after the meteor hammer has picked up momentum. In 228 AD, it's recorded that a Cao Wei warrior severely injured an enemy officer on the battlefield with a meteor hammer assault. By swinging the meteor hammer and letting go at just the right moment, it enables me to build enough power to strike the opponent with enough force to either knock him out or possibly kill. Yet the true speed, power and performance of a meteor hammer strike remains a mystery. Using the latest tools of fight science, researchers are beginning to unravel the truth behind this legendary weapon. With martial arts weapons, which are obviously thousands of years old, it's a bit of a mystery as to how they were developed in the first place. With modern technology, obviously we can do a bit of a detective story and we can now investigate just how much uh, destruction they could actually cause. Dr. Ewan Griffiths uses the latest high-speed photography to analyze sporting performance. Can he, using these tools of modern science, discover how the meteor hammer was optimized and the speed at which it strikes? With this technology, we can look at velocities, accelerations and forces that we were never able to do before. With martial arts, we can estimate the amount of force being developed in punches and kicks, for example. As a comparison to the meteor hammer, Ewan will analyze a punch. We're going to use a Shaolin twisting punch, where we're going to try and relax all the muscles in the body to get as much power through the body as possible. The slow motion allows Ewan to produce a scientific breakdown of Michael's Shaolin twisting punch. From the movement of the bag, I'm going to use inverse dynamics to work out the amount of force in the punch. Inverse dynamics is a mathematical system that tells us which muscle is active and how much force that muscle is exerting. If this punch was aimed at your face, it would be coming towards you at 18 miles an hour. The amount of force in the punch worked out at 188 pounds. The punch strike only lasted for seven hundredths of a second, so it would be over very quickly. But how will the meteor hammer perform in the slow motion analysis? In spite of its reputation, no one has ever explored the weapon in this detail. Now we're ready for the first test, and I'm going to swing the meteor hammer without using any real swinging momentum. The team is attaching a harder surface to the punch bag, as Ewan's calculations rely on seeing the speed at which the hammer retreats after its first impact. Seen in slow motion, a throw can be initiated quickly and efficiently by a skilled fighter. The velocity was 21 miles per hour, and the amount of force was 93 pounds against the wooden target. That lasted for 1.4 hundredths of a second. So bearing in mind that this was a fairly low velocity of release, it's about half what we measured in the punch. 
The team's final test will attempt to increase the Meteor Hammer's force. Can Michael achieve even more power by increasing the number of revolutions? When the Meteor Hammer is being spun round, the tension in the rope is actually called the centrifugal force. And this is the force which is responsible for keeping the object moving in a circular path. Seen in slow motion, Michael is able to achieve four rotations a second. More rotations build up greater stored energy in the rope. On its release, the energy is transferred to the metal hammer. This final test using the centrifugal force has shown that the velocity of the meteor hammer was increased to 31 miles an hour and the amount of force in the impact was 178 pounds. Now, this is approximately double what we were measuring with a direct release. The test has shown that the meteor hammer is likely to fracture an unprotected skull. Yet while powerful, it exerts no more force than a Shaolin punch. Its advantage lies in that it's a punch thrown from three meters away and at twice the speed. But does that really make it an ideal weapon for killing on the battlefield? Using modern technology, scientists can even design the optimum meteor hammer. Michael's hammer weighs less than 300 grams. If you had a weight of 22 ounces and a length of 1.4 yards, this would take the weight of the strike up to about 1,200 pounds, which is then approaching half a ton of force. That means a 600-gram hammer would strike with the force of six punches, easily enough to kill. It's conceivable that ancient warriors did use hammers of this size to just that deadly effect. Nearly all martial arts weapons were first seen on the battlefield and designed for large-scale warfare. Ancient Discoveries investigates the legendary weapons said to have severed the limbs and heads of enemies. From ancient Greece, Rome and Egypt to the Middle East and Asia, all ancient civilizations developed the technology to kill. Yet as the battle turned into personal conflict, commanders needed men who could cut down the enemy in a fight to the death. In early China, when they appointed people to lead their troops, they were very often looking for heroes. Men who could lead personally into battle, wielding weapons and cut down the enemy, setting an example to their men. The same weapons wielded by Kung Fu masters were also deployed by ancient military commanders. Weapons that were designed for severing the limbs and heads of enemies. This weapon is known as the Da Dao, the big knife. It was the main arms in wars and battles. It was also the favorite of many ancient generals and warriors. It can be used by both cavalry and soldiers on foot. Between the 10th and 13th centuries, the ruling Chinese dynasty, the Song, was at war with the Jin dynasty. The Song infantry needed a weapon to combat enemy ground troops and attacking cavalry, and that meant something with reach and power. When being swung fast, it could severely wound your enemies. It was recorded that in the Song dynasty, a general chopped off three heads in one go, the head of his opponent, the head of his opponent's horse, and head of the opponent's weapon. This was branded as the three heads at one cleave, which is a very famous story. The key to its success was its sharp and extremely heavy metal head, which could weigh up to 40 kilos. On a Chinese battlefield, you would probably have the smell of ruptured intestines. You'd be slipping on the blood that was spilled on the ground. It will be a complete mess. Leading Shaolin martial artist Ian Armstrong is investigating the areas of the body that ancient warriors would have targeted on the battlefield. This can quite easily sever a head that sort of action. If I bring it across the abdomen, this will more or less instantly open up the abdominal wall, which will mean that all of the intestines fall out. If I use a downward cut, I would come here through the collarbone, pull the weapon out this way. Tom Richardson, curator of the Oriental Gallery at the Royal Armouries in Leeds, has been studying the development of one of the earliest death weapons in the history of warfare. A weapon that, according to ancient Chinese legends from the 4th century, was favoured by General Lu Bu of the Three Kingdoms period for its enormous killing potential. 
This is a Chinese halberd, G, which can be wielded in two hands, either for thrusting or for cutting with. Long weapons like these are a mainstay of Chinese infantry from a very early period. The G was a long and powerful weapon that combined a heavy steel or bronze spear tip with the curved metal blade of the axe. Its development dates back to the Shang dynasty that ruled China over three millennia ago. That's the key thing with these weapons. They can be used as spears, but they can also be used as cutting weapons wielded in two hands. You can imagine from the size of the weapon just how powerfully this can be wielded. What made the G a groundbreaking invention was that it was a multi-assault weapon. The spear end allowed the user to stab, and the blade of the axe could be used to slash and hook, making it a triple attack weapon. The best areas to target with the halberd would have been areas where there were blood vessels that were quite close to the skin, say arteries that would rapidly bleed and cause death of the uh, combatant through loss of blood. It was not only the battlefield where weapons were used to kill. It was common in rural China for bandits to strike with no warning, sacking temples and robbing villages. To combat such attacks, there are legends of a deadly weapon that could not only defend against spears, staffs and swords, but was also effective against multiple attackers. Deer antler sabers were known throughout China. These specialized bladed weapons date to around the 18th century and consist of two crossed steel crescents. This crossing produces four curved claw-like points, one of which is extended as the main blade. They're believed to have last been used in anger by a legendary Kung Fu master, Dong Hai Chuan, who studied ancient martial techniques in the mountains of China. In the 19th century, he's said to have defeated many armed bandits while moving like a hurricane. Chinese martial artists Zhang Yi, Yan Hong and Zhang Zhen are researching the ancient techniques of this mystery weapon. What I have here is a pair of Yan Yang Yu, an ancient weapon. I've been practicing and using them for six years. As a weapon, it's very mean and very special. Its techniques include scratching, flapping and checking. The deer antler sabers allow Yan to defend himself against the staff and straight sword because his hooking and trapping techniques break their energy. These are not toys, but genuine weapons, which cause casualties. When being used like this, they could stab at your enemy's throat. As they are designed as direct appendages of the hand, they can trap weapons while also cutting and slashing, making them the ultimate short weapon. Since they're small, they can be concealed and used as a stealth weapon for assassinations. And as we'll see, stealth was an important element in some of China's most effective weapons. U.S. Navy SEALs are famed for their ability to infiltrate and attack from under the water. But is it possible that ancient covert operatives used the same techniques thousands of years ago? There are legends of a secret weapon known as the MAC. It's really like a long needle, and in that respect, it parallels the Italian stiletto. If you watch a lot of American gangster films, they use ice picks. It's exactly the same thing. The MAC is a mysterious weapon that is not listed in traditional ancient Chinese military manuals. According to legend, it was developed in the sacred mountains of MA in central China during the Song dynasty between the 10th and 13th centuries. These are the MAC. They work on a simple level. They can spin on a 360 degree axis. It allows me to move them so here I'd gain a lot more force behind my punches and obviously for stabbing and slashing motions. Water was common guerrilla terrain for Song soldiers and their enemies. All major ancient Chinese towns were built around rivers, lakes and paddy fields. It's said that soldiers and assassins operating in these areas used the MAC to dispatch the sentries that patrolled buildings and ships at the water's edge. 
As a stealth weapon, it's easily concealed. It's kind of like the modern commando knife that you see uh, Navy SEALs and Royal Marines use nowadays. It doesn't have the same edge, but it is utilized very easily in exactly the same way. Researchers today are looking into how the needles were actually used by covert forces in sentry removal. The killer would target a sentry standing near or in the water, where the 25 centimeter long steel needles with a flat rhombus point are set to hold an advantage. Its design enables the user to maneuver stealthily underwater, retaining the hand dexterity and movement that a longer weapon would not allow. The ancient assassin would have used the sharp points of the needles to stab and slash unprotected arteries. The subclavian and the uh, femoral arteries are very much in exposed areas. As such, would be easy to target. If they targeted these areas and they'd driven one of these MAC needles into the artery, it'd be very difficult for the artery to close. If you manage to get them in between the ribs, the lungs would deflate so that the combatant can't breathe. To complete their analysis of the MAC, the team will compare it with a longer weapon in a water combat situation. On land, a small weapon like the MAC would be no match for longer weapons with their extended range and heavier weight. The team wants to know whether the same applies in water. They are discovering that a long weapon that requires two hands is virtually impossible to use effectively against an enemy in the water. The attempts of the practitioner to try and penetrate the water with the weapon was very, very difficult because of all the resistance. This thing almost hydroplaned across the top of the water and lost all its power. The results are that the MAC is indeed a very effective underwater weapon. Very much the ultimate stealth weapon in that time. Like the MAC, the nine-section chain whip could have easily been concealed. Though its reach and unique abilities would have made it a land weapon, one that was deceptively vicious. The nine-section chain whip is a weapon that was used to inflict both slashing and piercing injuries. Consisting of nine linked metal segments, the whip has a handle at one end and a metal dart at the other. The best place to target would have been an unarmored area, such as the face or the eyes or the side of the head. It's thought that the nine-section chain whip was first deployed on the battlefield as a tertiary weapon during the Jin Dynasty of the 5th century AD. Over time, the weapon was adopted by assassins because it was easy to conceal and allowed the user to strike from a longer range. When carrying it, you can coil it around your waist like a belt, or as people did in ancient times, in a pouch on your back. So if you were under attack from your opponents, you could use it as a secret weapon. Using the latest electronic body protector equipment, the team has set Master Song, a leading practitioner, a challenge. How many blows can he inflict in a 15-second attack? This body protection kit has very similar Bluetooth technology to your average mobile phone, laptop computer. The team attaches equipment that uses air channel sensor foam to send data back to a computer. It will record Master Song's attack speed during a 15-second period. In 15 seconds, Master Song scored 2.2 hits per second. 33 hits in 15 seconds. Can you imagine what kind of effect 33 hits on someone's body, like you've just seen, would make? If you hit the side of the neck, then obviously you can take out some of the carotid vessels and jugular veins and cause bleeding. If you hit the side of the head, you can possibly cause hemorrhagings inside the brain as a result of piercing that area of the brain. 
Tests have shown that the hidden weapons developed for assassination attacks would have inflicted lethal wounds when in the right hands. But sometimes assassins required a weapon that had to remain hidden. Ancient Chinese engineers set their minds to designing such a device. This was 2,000 years before the invention of the high-velocity sniper rifle that can hit a target from over 1,000 meters, a different kind of unseen weapon. All sorts of devices were invented to enable covert operations to get close to powerful individuals to kill them, basically. According to an ancient Chinese legend, there was a weapon that allowed the assassin to shoot his target in the face with a poisonous dart. The device was triggered when the assassin bowed. The reason for the face being targeted is that it's not covered by anything and isn't armored. Chinese assassins were expert in using poisons derived from animals found in the western mountains of China. Everything from snake, spiders, and centipede poison was used to kill, and kill fast. If you have a poisonous needle going into the skin of the face, the face is very well supplied by blood vessels, and any poison will be rapidly disseminated throughout the body and would probably reach the brain very quickly. The back crossbow is believed to have been invented around the 11th century by Xu Liang Chen, but how the device delivered the poison has remained a mystery for over a thousand years. Now, the idea of these pieces is that they could be secreted about the person of the assassin so he could get reasonably close to his target without being discovered. It probably would have been something of a suicide mission because this was the only armament he'd probably be able to get through. And once he'd fired these things off, he would have probably been cut down pretty quickly by any kind of guards or retainers. Poring over forgotten Chinese manuscripts, leading model maker Richard Windley is deciphering the back crossbow's mechanical components. Now, this was strapped to the back of the assassin, and when he got close enough to his target, he would bow, and as he was bowing, this would line up with his target. He pulls a little hidden cord, which releases the trigger, and one single bolt is fired. The internal mechanical components of the device allowed the single missile to be latched into the trigger mechanism and then set by using the pressure of the mechanical spring. This is the bolt which we're hoping to fire from this device. There's a little groove on the collar which locks into the trigger mechanism, so when the trigger's released, it just simply unlatches that and that's projected through the front of the device. Although it's believed that this weapon was manufactured, mystery surrounds its effectiveness. For the first time in hundreds of years, the ancient design will be tested. Leading Shaolin Kung Fu fighter Ian Armstrong will investigate its potential as an efficient poison delivery system. The issue, I think, with this is accuracy, that if I bow and lift my head so that I can look at the target that I'm shooting at, I'll shoot myself in the back of the head, so I have to drop the head, which means I'm shooting blind. The back crossbow would have been fitted under the assassin's clothes and the string attached to the trigger mechanism fed through his sleeve. The machine's design meant that the assassin needed assistance in setting the mechanism before going on his mission. Okay. Yep. With the mechanism set, Ian will attempt to hit a target from 10 paces away. Okay, now if you'd like to bend down now. I would say that's more effective than I thought it would be. And I think that with practice, you could get a reasonable degree of accuracy. The missile penetrated the target to a depth of around five centimeters, deep enough to deliver poison into the unprotected skin. It hit fairly centrally, a little bit low. It would be enough to hit a human body, but not accurate enough to, for instance, go straight into an eye or straight into the throat. Were it carrying poison, then all it's got to do really is get underneath the, the surface of the skin, poison into the bloodstream, and it could be quite lethal. The test has revealed that while the mechanism would have been powerful enough to deliver a surprise poison attack, its lack of accuracy would have made it an unreliable assassination tool unless used by an experienced operative. The history of assassination in China is as old as the country itself. 
In 221 BC, after 500 years of relentless and ferocious warfare, the country was unified under the Emperor Qin. In 700 BC, there were about a thousand independent states. By 220, there was just one left, and that was Qin, which incidentally is where we get the name China from. It's recorded that the first emperor was at high risk of assassination by his enemies, and that he banned all weapons from the royal palace, but his paranoia left him vulnerable. The result was that when someone did get close to him with a dagger, no one was able to do anything about it. And the Qin Emperor was forced to defend himself with the sword. Unfortunately, he was no swordsman himself, and it took seven blows to finish the man off. The attempted killing of Emperor Qin with a poisoned dagger is one of the earliest recorded assassination attempts in history and set the stage for centuries of subterfuge and covert operations. The master armourers would have come up with these ideas. There'd be prototypes built. So over a period of perhaps a few months or a few years or even several generations, these things would be honed whereby they would work absolutely perfectly. Richard has found evidence that a variation of the back crossbow was manufactured in the 11th century. Instead of firing one missile, it fired five and was secreted in the assassin's sleeve. It was known as the plum arrow launcher. Because there's five shots, the front of the device looks a bit like a stylized plum flower. That's where the name originated. The idea of having a multiple shot weapon was that you wouldn't have to be quite as accurate. So it was a sort of spread gun or scatter gun effect. The power to launch the five arrows came from a spring-loaded piston mechanism. This device composes two main components. The front part contains the guides for the little darts and the trigger mechanism, which is that little thing there. And the main body contains this large helical spring and a piston. Grooves on the missiles lock into the trigger plate, so when the trigger plate is released, the pressure of the spring fires them towards their target. Richard will load the plum arrow sleeve, ready for testing. Each of these has to locate fairly accurately inside the uh, recesses in the pistons. And this is the tricky bit where I've got to exert the actual pressure of the main spring. I've got a pretty substantial spring here, so it's taking quite a bit of force. I would think there's probably 30 or 40 pounds force on that spring. There, that's clicked into place. To test the dispersion from a range of 15 meters, Richard has modified the missiles with paintballs. The assassin needed to ensure that at least one poisonous missile penetrated the skin of the target. I was quite impressed. I think it gave a better result than I was expecting. The accuracy of the device was quite good. If the head was your target, you'd be looking to get at least one on target. The tests have revealed that the Plum Arrow sleeve launcher was an improvement on the back crossbow. Its multiple missile launch system enhanced the assassin's chance of delivering poison to the target. These were just two of the lethal weapons that soldiers and martial artists of the East may have had at their disposal. But ironically, one of the most dangerous weapons of all is one that we all have, the human body. Legends tell of a mysterious move that allegedly took hours or days to kill someone. Is it possible that the mythical death touch was all too real? The ancient martial arts are surrounded by myths and legends but one stands head and shoulders above all others, the so-called death touch. Dim Mac is the ancient Chinese art of inflicting either instant or delayed death by a touch. Known throughout the world as Dim Mac, the death touch is an ancient technique that is said to cause knockout, death, and even delayed death using only the hand. To perform a death touch with Dim Mac, you don't need a lot of force. It's said that a nine-year-old child has enough strength to perform the techniques. Many believe that Dim Mac was devised in the 12th century by Zhang Sanfeng, the martial artist who is credited with developing the original Tai Chi form that is still practiced all over the world. 
Tai Chi is a set of smooth, flowing exercises used to improve balance, flexibility, and muscle strength. According to the legend, this knowledge spread rapidly and influenced the development of many Chinese martial arts. What we practice here in Mountain Wudang is a new system of martial arts started by Zhang Sanfen, founder of Tai Chi. He studied all the other styles of martial arts and integrated them with the Taoist theories of keeping healthy as well as theories of the body's circulation. This school is located in the mountains of Wudang Shan in southern China. Since the 13th century, Taoist temples located high in this 72 peak mountain range have been home to the Grand Masters of Wudang Kung Fu. Zhang Sanfeng's invention was based on the work of his predecessors. He created a brand new series of martial arts techniques by integrating motion and silence with internal and external exercises. The ancient temples of Wudang combined meditation with the art of warfare and developed a technique of using internal power to support external movement. Part of the Wudang philosophy is that within the human body, there are networks of pathways called meridians. These carry qi, or energy, throughout the body, which can be controlled for use in combat. The idea that there is qi inside the body is quite a, a real one. Anything that drives the body provides a life force is qi. The points of a dim maca salt on the body correspond to the qi points, or what we know as acupuncture points. Dim mac is the art of more or less attacking the qi. It's quite a scientific process and it's based on the theory of Chinese medicine. Sports scientist and martial arts expert Dr. Michael Kelly has spent years studying the medical effects of dim mac on the human body. The original founder who linked martial arts and the acupuncture points was said during folklore to have experimented on prisoners and bribed jailers to experiment and see which areas were more vulnerable. Scientists believe that the effects of dim mac are linked to changes in the body's autonomic nervous system. This system unconsciously controls the blood pressure, heart rate and breathing. If for some reason you compress the carotid artery, the autonomic nervous system thinks that the blood pressure is increasing. It doesn't want the blood pressure to increase beyond a dangerous level. So what happens is a reflex slowing of the heart. As part of his research into the death touch, Dr. Kelly has learnt the ancient techniques. He's able to perform a low-level attack that targets the dim mac points. Coming in, I'm using the branch of the ulnar nerve to squeeze down and bring him towards me. I'm using my palm to strike as he's fighting up. A full-blown dim mac assault effectively decreases the blood flow to the internal organs, leading to dysfunction and then failure. A little bit dizzy, I feel the tingling going through, through the extremities from the shot, a little dazed. And he's being easy on me, so I can definitely really put a lot more force in it, there'd be some problems. It's Dim Mac's legendary ability to inflict a delayed death that has caused the most skepticism. But could the death touch be a reality? If we have attacked a particular meridian, it could be up to 22 hours before the chi actually concentrates in that meridian and the maximum effect is felt. An ancient text attributed to Xu Qi Tsai in the 6th century records that delayed death can occur if a vital point in the chest is targeted. One of the old assassination techniques used would be to inflict an injury on the spleen, such as that uh, wouldn't be detected for a number of days. If the spleen is attacked, it will start to bleed internally. After a few days, as the blood continues to seep away, the membrane will expand until it bursts. When it bursts, blood will be released rapidly into the abdominal cavity and death occurs. As part of his research into Dim Mac, Dr. Kelly also uses modern scientific equipment to analyze its effect on the human body. We're going to bring in a Brazilian martial arts expert. Brazilian martial artists are known for their ability to induce a very efficient chokehold, particularly on the carotid sinus or the stomach nine point, which is considered the dim mock point. 
Using an electrocardiogram machine, Dr. Kelly will investigate the effects of DIMMAC on the electrical activity of the heart. I'm going to start monitoring now. Viewers are warned not to try this at home. Okay, Fernando, you want to get ready? Yes. Fernando okay. Sarmento is a highly trained martial okay. artist who knows how to exert pressure without causing permanent damage. Okay. His heart rate dropped from 110 to 62. What we just saw was significant because the EKG monitor showed a 20-point drop in his heart rate, and the actual loss of consciousness took place in about four seconds. Had that gone on further, death would have ensued. It's only now, using modern science, that researchers such as Dr. Kelly are beginning to unravel the truth behind the legends of the death touch. Yet DIMMAC is not the only technique that uses the idea of controlling the body's chi. Iron shirt qigong is an ancient practice that is said to strengthen the body's internal energy or chi to protect against injury. Chinese qigong is a very profound and precious practice inherited from ancient China. As you nurture and cultivate qi inside your body and strengthen your muscle and bones externally, you can break stone or bricks. The practice of Qigong goes back thousands of years, but its use in preventing pain remains controversial outside the martial arts world. The Qi energy in the body, we concentrate this energy at a point and it can take uh, punishment over and above what it would normally be able to take. But could Qigong be more psychological than physical? It is possible to condition martial artists so that they do feel the pain, but they don't worry about it. You bombard the body with so much stimulus, the person who the pain is being inflicted upon comes to accept it as being normal. Why do we hear in Chinese martial arts all the time about how powerful softness is? Don't I want to be as hard as rock? If I can make my body elastic, pliable, like the rubber, then when the body is hit, it will simply deform and bounce out again. But it's not only soft and elastic parts of the body that are said to withstand pain. Qigong practitioners claim to be able to withstand blows to the head. An instantaneous force of over seven kilos is believed to be enough to cause a simple fracture of the skull. What I'm going to do now is one of the most difficult of the Iron Shirt Chi Kung demonstrations. I'm going to put my head in a pile of blocks. The blocks are going to be struck with the hammer so that the whole pile breaks, but hopefully not my head. Whatever you do, under absolutely no circumstances, try this yourself. I've been practicing this art for 28 years, and I've had the very best instructors. Using a five kilogram sledgehammer, Ian's team will attempt to smash through 40 centimeters of breeze block without harming him. In terms of Qi Kung practice, obviously what I'm doing is concentrating all my Qi in my head and using the Qi energy to resist injury. From the myths of Dim Mac to the mystery of Qi Kung, the history of the martial arts is littered with legendary killing techniques that still shock and intrigue. Some ancient death weapons and techniques laid the foundations for the military tactics used today. Others were so bizarre that they remain firmly rooted in the ancient world. The mysteries of the macabre death weapons are just beginning to be unraveled. So what new discoveries remain out there? Discover